Hey there, boys and girls. I know you missed it. So get excited for some more flipping in the Flipville. We're going to talk about waves today. A little introduction for you. Won't take very long. Make sure you watch the video. Pause the video. Take good notes on the video. And that way you'll do better when it comes time for the quiz, which may be very, very soon. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, waves have several different parts to them. It's called the anatomy of the wave. There's the crest, which is at the cresty part of the wave. At this point, the water is falling over itself, forming a crest, uh, not like the toothpaste. There's also troughs, which is the uh, lowest part of the wave. And they fall, flow in this uh, crest trough pattern, which is usually different from the still water level, which is where you have zero energy. Right, that would be the level where the water is when it is not moving. And that is actually found halfway between the crest and the trough. So here's a picture of a wave. Label me the parts of the wave. You see up here you got the crest. Down over here would be the trough. And halfway in between, right where the water is at the still water level, that is uh, yeah, halfway in between. Doesn't mean that there's no energy there, just means that for normal water, there would be no energy. Again, you've got your crest, you've got your trough, and then halfway in between is the still water level, which would be right about that. Good. Now there's wave height is a measure of how tall the wave is. Essentially, that is a measure from the bottom of the trough to the top of the crest. That is called face height. In Hawaii, it's worth mentioning that they record their waves, although they are bigger, they're artificially bigger, because they record them by the back height, which would be this distance here. Waves do three main things. They transfer energy, they also reflect energy back, and they tend to refract and bend the energy uh, around and through things. If they don't do those, then it is not considered by scientists to be a wave. So it must do these three energy-related activities to be considered a wave. So let's talk a little bit about uh, waves. Just to give you a reminder from the freshman science class, there are longitudinal waves. They transfer the energy with the wave. Sound is a good example of a longitudinal wave. There are also uh, transverse waves, which unlike longitudinal waves do not need a medium, and they travel, they travel perpendicular to the way that they push energy. Right? So if the wave's going this way, it's actually pushing energy off to the top and the bottom. Light is a good example of a transverse wave, and because light is really weird and transverse waves are also really weird, they tend to not always need a medium to go through, which is, yeah, weird. Here's an animation of a longitudinal wave. You can see that over here on this side is showing you the flow of energy, and it's pushing the molecules with that energy. Yeah, ocean waves do that. Here is a transverse wave, you can see on the top the wave is actually traveling this way, just like people doing the wave, you know, like, yeah, we're doing the wave, like, ah, oh, class wide do the wave right now. Good, looks good. But you can also see that it's actually pushing the molecules up and down. Also worth mentioning, the farther you get from the wave, the less and less displacement you can have. You see that these molecules down here on the bottom are actually not moving at all, while the ones up here are moving more and more. They gave you the blue ones so you can see that the molecules actually stay in the same place. Now what's really fun is in water we have these things called orbital waves, which are actually a combination of both. So water, when it's in the ocean and being a wave, actually flows with a longitudinal wave, but also transfers energy like a transverse wave, which is crazy. So here is a diagram showing you that, and you can see that the boat is moving in a circle, just like you saw moving in a circle with the, tra with the transverse waves, but the boat is also pushed along with the wave, 
And so it is also a longitudinal wave because it's actually pushing energy in that direction as well. And it actually has a tendency to push the water molecules that direction too. So in addition to those large overarching currents, we also have smaller, much more localized winds that actually move materials longitudinally like a longitudinal wave, but then they also transfer energy, energy and transversely like transverse wave. And they, they look like this is basically what I'm saying. I'd say up in the top gives you another way of thinking about longitudinal and transverse waves. And then it shows you what the water do, which is the coveted orbital wave. And so you can see on the picture, it looks like a transverse wave. It flows with water like a transverse wave. It's got the circular doodle going on. As you get lower and lower, you actually lose a ton of the energy. You see down here, that below half the wave length, which again is the distance from one trough to the next, or from one crest to the next, that is your wave length. When you go half the depth below the wave length, you can actually see that there is not a whole lot of stuff happening in the water anymore. So if you're uh, in the middle of some very tumultuous waves, if you just dive down below or half the depth of the wavelength, then you can see that everything will be fine. At the top though, you're gonna get thrown around like a little bit of ragdoll. The bigger the wavelength, the more energy that is being able to be carried with that wave because you're moving more and more water. Normally, bigger wavelength is less energy because you know the vibrations, but with these ones, it gets all crazy. Here's another diagram showing you uh, that same idea. And again, you've got your crest and your trough, and you can actually see the movement of the water is circular, like an orbital. That's why we call it the orbital wave. So let's talk about how the waves are generated. They're all starting off with wind. Uh, the moon can do it too. Those are called tidal waves. Those will be a little bit later, but we're gonna focus mostly on the windy waves today. Large submarine disturbances like uh, submarines and ships can actually make their own waves as well. If it's a very large vessel like an aircraft carrier that can actually push a bunch of water and start the wave. For the most part when we think of waves, we're thinking of the wind waves, the big waves, but again, uh, there are other ways of making waves. Another thing that could include in submarine disturbances would be earthquakes and changes in the seafloor. We're going to talk about those a little bit more. Uh, for the most part, waves are generated in an area called the fetch. So you can think of like, oh, here, boy, fetch the paper. Like, oh, here, wind, fetch the water. And then it's dispersed out, causing the wave to change shape as it moves along the area. Here's a picture showing that same thing. You can see right here where the wind is actually blowing. That is the fetch. And in the fetch, the water gets very crazy. You can see the water is very crazy. And uh, it's over here in the dispersion area. This is where the wave looks more like regular wave with the oceany doing ocean swelling type things. Now these waves actually have the ability to interfere with each other. When two or more waves come together, they actually interfere. It's always called interference. Even if the wave is being built up or if the wave is being destroyed, it's always called interference. There's constructive interference, which actually causes one wave to build on the other and can make the waves bigger. It'd be like if I was speaking and someone else was speaking on exactly the same frequency, when you heard the sound, it would actually sound louder to you because our two waves are building on each other. Uh, it's considered constructive if the crests line up, right? If one crest hits the other crest, that's the big part. Destructive waves, interference is the opposite. This is where the waves subtract you from each other, and for the math people, you probably already figured out that it's going to then be where the crest and the trough line up because the highest point and the lowest point, so they'll cancel each other out. You can imagine that if they're not exactly the same wave, then if the crest hits the trough and they could do all kinds of different things, or if it doesn't quite hit it just right, uh, yeah. All kinds of things happen. In addition to that, waves can also generate electricity. Here is a map that shows you different parts of the world and shows you how uh, the energy is being generated. I'm not talking wind power, I'm talking wave power, children. 
Here is a nice picture showing you a big uh, wall that is actually designed to catch the waves and generate electricity. This is an electric generator, very similar to a dam, but it's designed to be coastal and just hit the waves. Here's how it essentially works. You've got this housing, here's that big wall that we were looking at. Inside, you've got your turbine, the wind, actually is pushed, or sorry, the air actually is pushed, causing a little bit of a wind from the oscillating water. The water comes in, the water goes out, the water comes in, the water goes out, the water comes in, the water goes out, and every time it pushes up, it's pushing air up here to actually spin the generator and generate electricity. Of course, with the normal, you know, generating electricity type things, which is described right here. Also worth mentioning, some people hate this idea because it builds ugly, nasty walls on my sea areas where I could be on the beach with my loved ones and instead there's a generator making generator sounds. In addition to that, you can actually get energy from the wind as well. Because the ocean doesn't have all the friction that land does, the wind actually whips through the ocean areas a lot faster. And so the idea is if we could build some sort of very far offshore deep water wind generation I concept. We could make a lot of energy. Some places are actually doing it in the shallow water zone. This is actually a picture from Denmark. This is a wind farm that they have built off the coast. You can see there's real people in a real boat going down and zooming around. But this actually pushes from the wind, pushing and flying over the ocean with much less friction. You have higher speed winds, so they carry more energy, so we could generate more energy. A lot of people also hate this idea because uh, especially the current, which would be on the coast or just off of the coast technology, you're gonna be staring at wind turbines as far as the eye can see. There's a couple main categories of waves. We're going to talk about the categories, and then that'll be that. There's progressive waves, which are the waves of translation. It's actually moving water across the surface. There are also standing waves which actually uh, move the water back and forth. They're called waves of oscillation because, you know, it's an oscillation. Think about El Nino, La Nina, how it and then only on a much, much smaller scale. This would be like if you're in the bathtub and you kick some water down to the end of the tub, it would be coming back. The water actually does not end up moving uh, horizontally, it's oscillating around a fixed point. And obviously, you know, you've got this way movement, but I'm talking like it's not going from here to there without coming back. It's coming back, children. So you don't have any net movement. That fixed point is actually called a node. Here's a nice picture showing you uh, some waves, and you can see the red brutals going back and forth. That is actually showing you what happens with a standing wave. It's just going back and forth, it's oscillating, right? The water is not actually moved horizontally because it comes right back. Progressive waves are the main ones that we're going to focus on. Uh, there's deep water waves, which usually occur out in the open ocean and are generated pretty much by the wind. There's also shallow water waves, which have a tendency to interact a little bit more with the seafloor because it's shallow. Remember, once you go down a depth of half the wavelength, there's negligible water movement. So in shallow water, uh, the depth of the seafloor may not even be that much. We're talking continental shelf area here. The waves, as described as feeling the seafloor, and as a result, they do all kinds of craziness. We'll talk more about that later. There's also transitional waves, and those are waves that actually have the quality of deep water and shallow water waves because they're in transition. Right. Again, we're going to talk more about the types of waves tomorrow. Thanks for watching, everybody.